Check one. Early that morning, late this night, the two dead boys get up to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, drew their swords, and shot one another. This is perfect for... Um, Halloween, Halloween time? <laughs> yeah. Parked outside, the cop car was speeding where the blind officer he was reading. His partner, the deaf officer, he heard the noise. He broke down the door and shot those dead boys. He's doing this because we're testing your audio. If you don't believe that this lie <laughs> is true, just ask the blind officer, because he saw it too. I thought you were dyslexic. You didn't mess up once. That, all of that's backwards. <laughs> I think. Was it? Did I say that right? So dyslexia is only one reading, right? Um, no? Actually, you know... Is there verbal? What we, are, what we are now discovering with dyslexia is... Uh, it, it, it can be for anything. It could be for colors. It could be for your brain just connects things in a, a unique way. Okay. And everybody's dyslexia is unique. Um, I flip letters. You know, for years I didn't think I was dyslexic. They discovered it when I was uh, sophomore year of high school, uh, way late in the game uh, for even detecting dyslexia. Uh, the... Uh, I, when I looked at the word Bob, I saw it the way, you know, I, I suppose everyone else sees it. But if I were to quickly write it out, or if I were to type it out, or if I were to, you know, try to explain what I saw, it would become out like a pop. It, 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 I flip things upside down. Oh. Instead of B's becoming D's, they can come P's and Q's and oh. G's. So I, I would look at Bob, see Bob, think Bob, but write pop. And it's really all about uh, just the connection between the brain, the word, often the word. It, it, the words are how you indicate it. Uh, but often people with dyslexia will, um, will say, will call Bob Brad. They'll get the first letter of the name, but, and, and it's like his dear friend, you know, like for years, it's mm -hmm. just the brain has this, uh, this glitch. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing in the end for me because it forced me to be creative. It forced me to be a puzzle solver because when you look at the world uh, it, without dyslexia, you see the street sign and you, you read what it says. I have to remember the environment and feel what the street sign says. And, uh, and so I, what do you mean by feel? Well, you know, like I can, I can read it. Like I, I'm good with like short sentences and things like that, but I'll actually get a massive headache if it's more like a, a paragraph. Like if you send me a text, I'm fine. But if you sent me an email, it'd be like, somebody read this to me, you know? Uh, but quick glances at street signs and things like that. If it's something I don't recognize, I actually often have to take a, a second glance and kind of think about it. Uh, but, you know, you find ways to get around it. You find ways to get around uh, reading things everywhere, you know, so uh, you just interpret your navigation in a different way. Okay. Yeah. That's fascinating. That is fascinating. It is. Yeah. And there, we have a school in Buffalo called the Gao School, which is a school just for dyslexic. Uh, oh, is that know? what that is? Yeah. So the Gao School focuses on that type of uh learning disability but it really is just a, a, a different way that the brain connects things and uh, it you know the the people that have come up historically the people that have come up with really creative solutions to things have shown that they probably had something like dyslexia uh, da Vinci wrote backwards because it was easier for him and, and it was harder for other people to read it but he had this reverse mirror language being left-handed, it was easier to draw and, and write that way, but also, you know, people think that he read it faster that way. Uh, Einstein uh, was, uh, had always a hard time writing things out. Uh, his, uh, his wife, who was also uh, brilliant, uh, would actually write the formulas out, you know, for him. You know, he, would, he, would, he would visualize it and see it, but I guess uh, he had some, some help with that, you know, uh, you know, because you have to learn how to navigate things, I guess you just have this creative spirit. And, uh, you know, if everybody is taught the same way, if everybody thinks the same way, well, who's going to come up with the, uh, a cure to something or an answer to something? It becomes a zero-one game if, it's, if everybody's standardized. So by having some people that uh, 
think differently, uh, then you now have a third way of knowing and a third way of understanding things. So it's a, it, like I said, it's a, it ended up being a blessing uh, to, uh, you know, to force myself to be creative, to problem solve every day, made it so that I can problem solve the puzzle of magic. You know, how can I give somebody a moment that isn't real? How can I, you know, create this experience that can't happen, but I want it to happen for them? And what do I do to set up the conditions to get them to experience that thing? So I'm that getting light out of that process, I think I owe it all to to actually being dyslexic. I think I, it uh, it was just a a side effect of me just figuring out what my world and how to navigate it. You know, and I couldn't read the magic books, but I wanted to be a magician, so I would come up with my own answers. And uh, most of the time, I was way more complicated than what the magicians were doing. <laughs> Ten percent of the time, I came up with the, the right answer, and maybe five percent of the time, I came up with a different answer, but it was better. And so I cashed in on those ideas, and I said, "What did I discover there that magicians weren't doing?" And then I started creating uh, magic tricks around those concepts, those principles, those uh, psychological traps, and uh, just uh, developed the whole product line based on uh, sleight of hand magic for magicians you know and I just created my own path and uh, a lot of people appreciate it uh, I know I have uh, a lot of magician fans out there that that do my magic uh, every day uh, sharing it with the world and uh, working with David Blaine uh, I'm proud to to create conversational real magic that's performed not in a theatrical sense but in in the the real world you levitate at all? If you like. <laughs> oh my god. It's like asking. You know, let's see, David Blaine, all the magic we designed for David, he is a body magician. So he, um, we, we create things for him that are, are head to toe magic. Uh, my, my specialty is, is sleight of hand, so I, I yeah. consider myself a, uh, a hand magician. So if I levitate things, it, I want to levitate. You know something with my hands instead of so even my hypnosis I, I tend to to you get my hands involved somehow uh, so yeah that's a, a weird uh, illusion there but it's fine <laughs> it's fine totally. all right I want to check the the spoon is not real <laughs> you know and that's that's you know the, the truth is hidden in in fiction you know it, it is not the the spoon that bends it is you that bends and uh, because it's literally all in your head. Uh, magicians just set up the conditions for your brain to create magic. Now, regarding the Matrix. Yes. So, 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 why don't we start slow? Yeah, let's, let's go. Yeah. yeah let's so, see. Oh, yeah, so, just cards jump. So re 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 regarding, regarding the, the, uh, the idea that this is all uh, an illusion. All right, do you want to just get into it then? Well, hold start. on, let me ask my question. All right, listen, all right. for all of our fans and viewers, welcome back to the Buffalo Happy Hour. I'm stealing Derek's thunder. Look, have you ever bent a spoon? Yes. See, I'm leaving. I, we're 13 <laughs> seconds in. Well, that's just because my dishwasher's broken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, the spoon bending uh, illusion is absolutely beautiful and breathtaking. You know, there's nothing wrong with somebody in the world going, look, a rainbow. What's wrong is when there's people that say, yeah, but I can sell you a map to get the pot of gold that's at the end of that rainbow. You know, magicians are not the rainbow and we're not the light. We're just the prism. You know, we, we set up the conditions for people to experience magic. We don't want you to believe. We actually want you to deny it because the whole art form is based on your inner child wanting to accept it while your inner adult needs to deny it. And that conflict in self is astonishment. So when you don't know where to put this idea because your inner child goes, yeah, that's awesome. And your inner adult goes, no, 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 I, I, I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you it's not what we think it is. So just calm down. Don't get excited, you know, because this is I'll figure this out for you. And that's where you get this good feeling because those moments happen in moments of learning. The first time you saw a helium balloon, it was magic. It's gonna, it's gonna go up. It's gonna keep on going up. It's gonna go up. Will it hit a cloud? Will it go up forever? What's forever? Yeah. You know. And now your brain melts, and then somebody ruins the illusion and says the word helium, 
And uh, that's a moment of astonishment that leads to, to an answer. And that's all education is these <gasps> two plus two is four because I get it now. And you're, 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 you grow, you mm -hmm. learn in that way. But a magician provides a moment that has no answer. So you get the feeling of about to learn forever. You know, you're like, there's an, I know there's a problem here and I got an answer and I'm going to find it, but it's designed to send you in circles. So you get the good feeling that, uh, that same feeling, that high that you chase when you're, when you see something new and beautiful and you don't, you know, I've never tasted this before. I never saw this before. I never heard this before. You know, it, any art form can get to a level of magic. You know, if you were there when Michael Jordan made the slam dunk from the follow line and no one else in history had done it before, mind blown, yeah. you know, that's magic. Uh, but a magician's job is to, on demand, deliver those type of feelings. Jesus. All right, do, do so... The, do the real intro. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody, to the Buffalo Happy Hour. Uh, we are here with Garrett Thomas, who is a local magician. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself and, or yourself and try to uh, explain what you do? Um, yeah, I, I create magic for uh, magicians. Uh, I design illusions uh, that uh, you might have seen on TV. Uh, I'm one of the writers for David Blaine, so I, I help him out. You know, and it's not like I design his tricks. Uh, he, really he's a part of the process and he he and i and, and other magicians together we all kind of go we want this to happen and then we figure out how to make it happen uh you know when i in college my roommate said never tell garrett you can't do something because either he'll figure out how to do it or he'll make you believe he did <laughs> right? uh, but when you meet someone they tell you their name and my, my name is garrett thomas and uh our names tell us nothing about each other Mostly due to the fact that my parents gave me my name without getting to know me, so it's it's it's, it's rude. But, uh, you know, they should have named me something magical like Siegfried or Roy. Those are magical names. You know, Garrett Thomas. That's a that's a strong name. But I I had to make my name magic. So uh, my signature actually will tell you a lot more about me. Garrett is G A R R E T T, and it's two R's, two T's, and a funny looking G. But that's both Garrett. G A R R E T T and Thomas T H O M A S. <laughs> so I, ha I had Michael at hello. Okay, good. So that's Garrett Thomas. And that tells you a lot about me. It tells you I have a lot of time on my hands. I got to get out more to cry for help. I'll keep this because I, you <laughs> know what? Yeah, I already have one. So uh, I actually do it. I think it's actually in my wallet, but. Um, Thank you. But anyway, so before we really dive in, yeah. we are here at Pearl Street Brewery in Buffalo. And if everybody doesn't know, Pearl Street does make their own beer. Yep. And they're, you, uh, you might hear be them hearing, working it, you're working the beer right now. Yeah, yeah. So if you hear that humming in the background, just know that it's that. Uh, we can either go outside, which has music playing, so we would get this video taken down from copyright. So I don't think anyone has a copyright on that hum, so we should be good. So, well, except for I'm going to run home and <laughs> in place that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to record this. And, you know. So before we dive into the magic part, I mean, I guess this whole thing is going to be magic. But yeah. we talked about in the audio test in the beginning of how you kind of developed your magic base off of your dyslexia. So w what was your childhood like? What did you when did you start doing magic? Well, my, my dad really loved magic. Uh, he was uh, a regular at the, the Forks Hotel. And in western New York, we had this bar where everybody that worked there was a magician. And it started in the, the late 40s. And it, But a lot of people don't know that the people performing magic at your tables or in the show were magicians. But also the guy making your, your food was a magician. And the guy serving at the bar was a magician. Like back then, you couldn't get a job there unless you were a magician. It just evolved that way. It wasn't like that was the plan. It was just... A magic hangout and uh, you know so we had this love for magic and my dad really uh, couldn't do magic but he would you know want to learn something so he would ask uh, Eddie at the bar you know I got my son what can I show him and Eddie would sell him a couple of tricks but he never could pull them off and then I could and that you know for a, a young boy to do something that your dad can't you know is awesome 
and then he loved it so we bonded on it and uh and then he you know he would show my friends some magic you know that those type of things so it instilled obsession very quickly and uh you know to me it was at first just a a way to connect with my dad then i realized that everybody loves it you know uh you know years later i started performing for my friends and uh, they they loved it and then i realized it was something that I, it could be a gift that to to give people you know that i could be the magic man and and you know in high school that's you know i remember this kid jason coming up to me and like proclaiming himself the class clown and i went oh wait a minute you got some competition you know because it was my my first day in you know i went to a, a private uh, middle school but then i went to dpu high school and uh the first day at orientation this kid jason did that and i went oh wait nobody knows me you know the private middle school was a very religious school so i could never show my magic mm -hmm. uh, i was uh because of my dyslexia the teachers at this middle school weren't trained to detect it and so they told me i was lazy and i was stupid and i wasn't applying myself and and that uh, i was never going to amount to anything and the power of christ compels you yeah and uh and uh, i i couldn't i couldn't pray the dumb away you know that's that's uh, <laughs> and uh but magic saved me because how do you know you're not dumb true like maybe this is what dumb feels like <laughs> right and everybody is on a different level because I, I can't feel what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And so what if I believe them? You know, but luckily I went home and when I'm looking at my, my magic I'm creating, I'm like, this is more complicated than the homework I can't understand, but I suck at that, but I'm great at this, or I'm, I'm getting better at this at the time. And I'm like, they're wrong. You know, I, I, just, Good for I just don't like this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how many people out there were, were told they were dumb and just believed it? You know, and, and today, you know, I, I try to open people's mind to these things. And I, I argue, well, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, you would think it's dumb, too. And then one of my uh, one of my patrons looked at me and said, yeah, but you're a fish up in a tree and I want to know how the hell you got up there. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I guess as a magician, I stand out in different ways. But, you know, it was either, uh, you know, I was a, a magician and it, my backup plan was to be in a, a, like a commercial artist so you know I was like I had my life set you know <laughs> like these two careers that are very risky and uh, but it, it turned out to be a, a blessing you know if you do what you love I uh, no matter if you make money or not you're happy you know if you you could you could find you can create a career or you can struggle but you'll have peace because you're doing what you love if you if you know it was something Jim Carrey pointed out that you could fail at something you hate just as much as failing at something you love. So What's the why, why do something yeah. you hate? Right. You know, it, it shouldn't, you know, so having a job just, I was working at Salvatore's and uh, I looked at the paycheck after taxes and I was like a busboy there at the time. And I said, you know, if I get two shows in a month, I'll make the same amount. Wow. Can I work my, my butt off to, to advertise or to get, to get two shows that's all i need two birthday parties you know back then i was you know doing these these uh family and shows and and i was like you know I, i'll do it i'll do it i'll just and then i i quit and that was my last uh non-magic related job you know at, at what age uh 16 you know so Pure maybe man. 17 that's yeah. awesome you know it was, it was uh you know i it was it, i loved working you know it bonding with team and friends that I made there uh, but you know it was just something I had to do and uh, I I just hustled and hustled and because of the Forks Hotel I struggled getting venues to want magic somewhere else so every other every other city in America magicians that wanted to perform at restaurants restaurant guys were willing to try it but because of the Forks Hotel, everyone went, no, no, that's what they do at the Forks Hotel. We're not going to do that. And that the Forks Hotel literally had to just, you know, it, it, the last owners tried to burn it down for insurance money, got caught and lost the building type of deal. And uh, they, uh, the building's gone. And, and then finally, you know, you know, venues in Western New York 
were willing to, to take a chance on, on magicians. So it was really a big hustle to uh, try to to become part of a, a regular venue, you know, being a, a glorified host at, at bars and venues in, in Western New York. But uh, over time, you know, I had two places and then three and then five and seven. And uh, before COVID, I was doing uh, nine venues a week. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, just, you know, learning how to be a magician every day and just, uh, you know, I'm basically in a, in a venue. I'm a glorified host. You know, my job is to keep people happy, hang out, entertain them, and uh, uh, keep the party going. You know, and just uh, I, I love I love the theater of it. it. You know, when you see a show on stage, it's staged. Mm -hmm. You know, stage magic is staged magic. So anything can happen. And then you're competing with Cirque du Soleil. You know, because and that's and if you want to see magic, go see Cirque du Soleil. You know, mm -hmm. I saw, you know, a, a football field size curtain get sucked into this little basket floating in 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 a water, and it's you know it blows your mind. You know right. that that was in the O show. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> no, that's just the that's just the opening scene, and it's just and the rest is just just beautiful. Yeah. It's just magic. Uh, I did a lecture in Vegas, and I had all the Vegas magicians stand up, and I went, you know, instead of going to the magic shows this year, I went to see all the Cirque du Soleil shows. And that's not the magic show. You know, if you're going to be a magic show in Vegas, you got to step it up. You know, you, you, know, you really got to... Because you're, you're competing with these theatrical artists that are creating wonder just as much as, you know, a magician does. And so I went the other direction. I said, you know, I want to go where Cirque can't go. I want to be one-on-one -on -one with people creating magic for them in a real moment. And, you know, if my job is to twist reality, it made sense to be in reality. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to keep it real. And uh, those theories are a big part of, you know, how David Blaine presents magic. You know, people compare uh, the popular magicians today, David Copperfield, Chris Angel, Penn and Teller, David Blaine and the guy that does magic for humans. Yeah, uh, Justin Willman. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these guys, you just you just named like four guys with million dollar budgets, and right. then one guy who's walking around New York City with a deck of cards. <laughs> right? Why did David Blaine have the same level of recognizable success as all these people with full professional shows? and teams you know of you know you know they got 30 or 40 people working and behind the scenes on a lot of these shows and david blaine was like four of his friends just with a deck of cards and a camera and he's got the same level of recognition it threw david off at first he's like why are they comparing me to copperfield you know what's mm -hmm. what's you know why you know i don't get it and i explained you know i i like puzzles so i like psychologically figuring out yeah we're, yeah why and uh i came to the conclusion that it's because it was authentic, because it wasn't an act. Right. Because David Blaine is David Blaine. You know, Penn and Teller, one guy talks, one guy doesn't. And when I when I met Teller, he talked to me. Broke my heart. Just horrible. And and Chris Angel is not an 18-year-old emo kid. It's just, like, <laughs> so sad. Like, he's, like, 53. It was, yeah. like, you know. He was heartbroken. Um, <laughs> but David Blaine right now, he, if you saw his last uh, balloon launch, you know, he's Daddy David. Why? Because he's Daddy David. You know, he's, he yeah. designed that whole illusion for, for his, his daughter. daughter. Right. And, uh, you know, he's just, he, you know, we named the first special. This was before I was a part of it. But he named the first special Fearless. And that's who he is. He just is so, he's just going to give of himself. He doesn't hold back. Uh, and it's, uh, it, you know, everybody else would try to, there are things that they think they don't like about themselves, but honestly, that's probably the good stuff about you. And David just accentuates it. So how did that, I mean, you're from Buffalo, mm -hmm. you graduate high school, you're doing magic at one to two venues, quit your job, and then you're on the phone with David Blaine. So like what, what occurred for that to happen because people from Buffalo are like, oh, you're from Buffalo. You're probably not going to make it. Like we're a small market. We're a small city. There's only 260,000 people. The bills kind of suck. Like we're trying to figure this out. And then all of a sudden there's like one to six people 
that quote unquote make it. Yeah. And like, so when I was like 18 or 19, uh, the, the international brotherhood of magic convention came to Buffalo as the host city. And they nominated me and it's just this nicety that to let one of the locals compete because usually to do competition magic, uh, you have to go through all these trials. But as a nice thing for the local uh, city, they they let the local a local someone local because uh, you know maybe people will come out to see the competition and stuff like that. So it's nice, and so uh, I signed up for the competition, and I never did competition magic before, and uh, I I ended up uh, getting third place, and uh, you know which is what was like you know, very rare for just somebody. Th- I'll try it. And yeah. Ended up ended up with third. And uh, then people started recognizing that I'm doing something different. You know, again, because I invented my own stuff, uh, you know, other magicians that liked what I did, I'm the only place to get it from. You know, you can either be the first to do something or the best. But if you're if you want to be the best, you got to race against everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to be the first. And. my take on magic was totally different. So uh, I created this one trick when I was 16 years old uh, where you, you take a ring and you toss it on the finger. And uh, people just needed to learn it. And the fact that it was uh, just, uh, it wasn't a special ring and it, it, everything could be examined and things like that. Uh, it, it was something that took off and I, I had this production company, uh, Five Star Magic Media, uh, made me a deal, and they flew me to Colorado, and we filmed this this product, and I had a VHS, you know, video instructional thing that was sold to magic shops around the world, and uh, it began to establish uh, my name, uh, and then I got more video projects. So David Blaine ended up hearing about this trick because uh, of that publicity in the underground magic world of instructional magic. And, you know, uh, a friend of David said, you got to see this trick. This is awesome. I saw him at this convention. You know, you, you got to see this kid. And uh, David called me up and, and said, uh, hey, this is David Blaine. And it was right like a week after the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the first special aired. And, and he's like, uh, so I heard about this ring trick and, and I'm like, is this Joe? Who is this? Like, <laughs> like this is, you know, this is not David, right? I just saw you on TV the other night and he's like, no, no, this is, this is, this is David Blaine. And, and my friend told me about this ring trick. I'm like, is this, this is Adam. This is, <laughs> this is not David. You know, like, the I most just, David Blaine voice ever. Yeah. Well, well, you know, it's, you know, I thought when I first saw the show, I thought that was an act. His voice. Well, yeah. Because I'm His like cadence and everything. Yeah, studying theater, I know about contrast, and if people are reacting big, you know, if you are reacting big with them, their reaction won't seem as big, mm-hmm. right? If you're like, oh my goodness, you know, is you know, if you're playing it up, and a lot of magicians will do that to try to get them, you know, to parrot them, to copy them. Yeah, and uh, that's a it's a it's a strategy that works, but it's a little not it's not authentic. So David is all about authenticity. So David's like, no, I just if they want to react that way, they'll react that way, you know. And he just like and he never changes. Well, that's like, just who he is. Yeah, people flip out, and he's like, that was cool, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and but like, what and How it, are you it, doing? It, it, I thought it was an artistic choice to be like, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop my 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 character down. I'm gonna be like absolutely stoic, and uh, and let them let them have the spotlight. You know that was really uh, the, one of the major uh, brilliant moves for the art of magic, because I never believed you could do magic on television. Mm-hmm. I mean, right? Because you always thought that it was just cutscenes, yeah, or CGI a trick. or something. Yeah, you know that you can't validate anything. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So David didn't try. You know what he what he had done was he put the camera on the audience you know over time we we st- we, we almost stopped showing the tricks mm-hmm. you know it's all about uh, 
it's a, it's really a documentary about a human being enjoying magic. Sure. So and and if you want to see David perform live, then you'll see good magic. But if you see a show, there's no way we could validate an authentic, you know, an authentic reaction. Yeah, we we like we can show the reaction, but we can't show uh, that this ring isn't gimmicked. You know, you could check it out, and they could trust you. But I can't show them mm-hmm. on camera that this is that this ring is solid. So, so you're on the phone. Yeah, and uh, and so he uh, he says I got to learn this trick, and I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll send you the video. And he went, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> you got you're gonna come to Buffalo, and we're gonna hang out, and you're gonna make sure I do this right. New York. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Dyslexia. There you go. <laughs> no, that's, and it, it, that's those things happen all the time. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I'll flip things. So, uh, so my, my all my you, you know my dates are wrong. I'm, you know, I was born in six thousand seven hundred ninety one. <laughs> you know, so like, like that type of stuff. Uh, you know, it was it was BC. So yeah, <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> yeah, they were. What a good year. <laughs> Let's make the Middle East great again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so he says, we'll, we'll fly you out to New York. Teach me this trick. I'm flipping out. I can't. Yeah. I don't understand what's happening right now. So good. So um, so I, I... He's still looking at the name thing I you know. did. That's 10 minutes ago. So well, hold on. Stop interrupting him. Hold on. I, 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 I love the fact that he refused to just accept the video because right. it, it was a published trick. So legally... As a, a TV performer, he could all he had to do was just ask permission, and he could do the trick. But he was like, "No, no, it's your trick. You know, we're gonna pay you for your time. We're gonna get you out here. We're gonna take care of you. You're gonna make sure I do it right and do it justice, and make sure you're happy with it. So when I do it, it's perfect. And uh, and then if it ends up on air, we'll give you a kickback. And you know, like, and no one in the industry ever like cared that much about the in- creation." It was just always like some guy, even Houdini had a guy who made his tricks, you know, that type of stuff. So you're on the phone with David Blaine. Mm-hmm. He says all that. And then you're like, how do I still validate that this is true and you're not like a human trafficker? Yeah, no, there was uh, there, the the guy who, you know, saw me at the convention. Yeah. Uh, David gave him the phone and said, Ace, you know, you know you know talk to talk to this you know tell him it's me because <laughs> yeah. there was i wasn't believing him you sure. know and he's in ace gets on the phone garrett yeah you gotta you take this is david blaine you gotta get out here you could you know pack your bags you're coming to new york you're gonna show david blaine oh okay and then that, i recognized ace so so i had somebody validate it and uh i went out there we you know m- met up at this uh this little diner and then went up to ace's office and uh just uh, worked on, you know, showed him the basics of this trick. Uh, we became quick friends, and uh, he wanted me to be a part of uh, Magic, uh, you know, anything he was doing. He wanted uh, my ideas. Uh, you know, he, he he's a smart artist, right? and he the team he has, you know, you're, you're either brilliant or gorgeous. You know, you're just, you're just those, if you're in this room, you, it's, it's one of those two things. And, um, but he, he doesn't let us overlap skills, you know, like if somebody's good at something and somebody else is good at the same thing, you know, he'll, you know, he loves, he, lo- he loves everybody, but he, he'll, he'll, to create a good team, he spread it out. So he, he one time asked me, well, what are you going to do that no one else, you know, that the mm-hmm. other magicians that we have aren't going to do? And I'm like, well, I won't always have the answers, but I'll definitely have questions that no one else will ever have. And he, he loved that for some reason. It was uh, it was something that he just latched on because, you know, when you have questions, that's where you get the creative solutions. Mm-hmm. If you ask questions that haven't been ans- asked before, then then you can you can find you can mine in those areas and discover something new. So what type of magic like are there categories of magic i I know that you said you kind of specialize in sleight of hand but what is what are the other types of magic you know i mean there there are so many you can almost you can almost categorize them as each performer is totally different and the reason it evolved that way is magicians had never developed the theater we've always retrofitted the art of magic onto stages that already already existed so Doug Henning had dancing girls and laser lights in his Broadway show because it's Broadway. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and then uh, in Vegas you do the same thing, but there's also magic in poetry rooms and magic at comedy clubs and magic in restaurants and magic at bars and, and magic, you know, there was never a theater built for magic. And the reason there never was is because I don't think there can be. I think real magic is about twisting reality, and that's now. So the theater is wherever you're at. Mm-hmm. And because of that, certain styles didn't get lumped in together, although there are uh, stage magicians, parlor magicians, you know, kid show magicians, comedy magicians, mentalist, uh, which I like to call mental magic because mentalism to me feels like a con Mm -hmm. but mental magic is where you manipulate and create illusions with thought you know that feels a little more in the magic realm uh and 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 so on and there's people that do comedy and uh sleight of hand and there's people that do comedy and stage magic uh you know so there's all different uh types of styles that you can do i call myself a conversational close-up magician Uh, i'm gonna hang out magic's just gonna happen uh, you know, this is my fee for the, to hang out at your party mm-hmm. and just stuff will happen. You know, we will talk magic. We'll talk life. We'll, you know, you know, I wanted to set up a situation where the art of magic could do its job. So when some people go, I love magic and other people go, I hate magic. People, uh, other magician friends of mine will, will say, I don't get it. How can someone say they hate magic? It's like saying I hate music. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you hate country music, but you don't hate music. And, you know, the, but the, what that magician was missing, the point that that was missing is hate is a valuable response to magic. If you're struggling, a magic moment can lift you up and give you hope. But if you think you know everything... That same exact magic moment that gave that person hope will bring you down and it'll be like an ego check and you'll be like, I I hate this. I don't know anything. Right. And so it becomes this healthy neutralizer where it can lift the people up that needs to be lifted up and bring down the people that need to be brought down. And it reminds you that, uh, you know, that there's there's room to grow, you know, that you're not done. You know, that it's not this race to get to the happy end because, you know, you'll get bored with that, too, that we're, we're supposed to be in this state of flow. And magic kind of brings us to this balance point, you know, that we are, you know, in the end, it's all about balance. You want to drink? Great. Just don't drink too much. You, you, you want to uh, you want to eat? Great. Just don't eat too much. You know, everything's about balance. Uh, so magic reminds, you know, will automatically do that. Uh, other art forms, comedy magic, they're designed to lift you up. But if you're already, you know, having a good time, you don't need that. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you need an ego check. So I, I love that magic can do that. So I wanted to take advantage of that. And the only place to do that is in more uh, in a more real life situation. You know, historically, the magician is not someone you sought. In literature, in myth, in, in story, right. the magician is always someone you encountered during your dark time through the forest. You know, you you encounter the witch or the mm-hmm. wizard or the warlock or the leprechaun or the, the enchanted unicorn. That's one of my favorites. But, uh, and uh, then you've changed, but you don't know it yet. Th- that that encounter changed you. And uh, even like the Wizard of Oz. Uh, even though it looks like she's seeking the magician, she's off to see the wizard, you know. Mm-hmm. But he's the only one that can't do magic. He's the right. only one that's not enchanted. Everybody else is enchanted. And, you know, they say at the end of the movie that and the whole time you could get home and you, you had it with you the whole time. No, you didn't. You had it when you met Glinda. Right. <laughs> she gave you the shoes. And it was the encounter with the first magician you met, she hooked you up. She changed you, and your paradigm was shifted. And the symbolic nature is that the magician opens your eyes to the you that's waiting to be. You know that uh, wherever, whatever you need, uh, the art of magic, like water, becomes that next step for you. It, it's it's a way of erasing your paradigms of what you think is true, and giving you permission to redefine yourself. 
So speaking of that, who is your magician outside of your father liking magic? But yep. what made you then start, and how do you create your own tricks? And who was your influence growing up? Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, underground magicians most people wouldn't know about. Uh, Brian Gillis was a, a Buffalo-based magician uh, who moved out to L.A., became uh, Johnny Carson's favorite magician. And he had that conversational style. He was a direct student of Eddie Fector's at the Forks Hotel. He was a major influence, uh, pushed me. He, he was the first I saw on television where I was like, that feels real. That feels like a person. It didn't feel like an act. It didn't, you know... When you're a kid, you don't want to say, I want to grow up and pretend to be a doctor. Right. So why should I have to pretend to be a magician when I wanted to be a magician? Well, that's because you don't have supernatural powers. Well, magic doesn't require supernatural powers. Sure. You know, a hypnotist cannot hypnotize you, but he can set up the conditions for you to enter an alternate state of mind that's called hypnosis. But there's no, he has no power. you got to follow his lead, and you technically hypnotize yourself. But if you don't you know, follow his instructions, you're, you're not going to go into that state of mind. Uh, it's, he's, but you still call him a hypnotist. Mm-hmm. So I can be called a magician because I set up the conditions for you to experience something that isn't true. The guidance counselors must love you. Oh, they hated me. <laughs> You can pay your bills with magic. Well, yeah, there was this one time, like, uh, the guidance counselor. I was studying art, uh, and the guidance counselor was like, well, you're not going to make a living doing art. Now, my mother was an art teacher, you know, and she, I told her the story, and she went there and stormed in there. Oh, And she's like, touch something. What? What are you you talking about? Just touch something in your office. Like, what? Like, what what are you... You know, and she's like, "You see that stapler? It was designed by an artist. Oh, that wallpaper was this. That rug pattern that was designed by an artist. This desk was designed by an artist. How dare you tell my son he can't be an artist? Because everything in your world was designed by an artist. Wow. There's nothing Good for her. like, yeah. She went all out because, and it was, <laughs> you know, she, it was attacking her too. You know, her, her mm-hmm. career was art, and uh, and uh, you know, and immediately it gave me permission to, you know, that I can be a magician. You know that." Yeah, no one can tell you who you are, yeah. and so Mama said, "Magic's the devil." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she she let me be me. You know, yeah. it's it's uh, you know, your parents are you know they they have their views, and uh, you know you you can you know what love is when you know they still accept you no matter what. Right, and uh, you know that's I was like, man, your your love is better than most religions love because. You know, you do something wrong. They don't. They don't love you anymore. But your mother, a mother's love is strong. And you know that. Yeah, I mean, you know, Charles Manson's mother still loved him. You know that type of right. stuff. You know, it's like it's. You know, we're all connected. It's it's a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, being a magician, I, I kind of look at the big picture constantly because what magic really is is understanding that there is these words that create our truth. You know, it's it's these spellings, these this casting of a spell. It's language that actually creates everything. You know, I'm only Garrett the magician because everybody else says so. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I play that game game with you. So so it's a you know when you take a a step back, you you look and go, oh, there's people that are trying to control people and doing these horrible things and are manipulating this. You take another step back and go. Yeah, it's just this game that's going to go away in a little while, and they'll, they're will they not happier than anyone else. Right. You know, I, I performed for both uh, uh, Steve Wozniak and, and Ted Turner, and they both owned the world in their own way. Mm-hmm. And one of them was miserable, and the other one and uh, you wanted to hang out with all night, and, and I'll let you figure out who's who. So, <laughs> so you just, like, you, you wanted to. And so it wasn't. And then, uh, you know, I had uh, living downtown. You know, I had uh, friends that were homeless, and they wanted to be. They, they chose that, and some of them, you know, were, were miserable, and some of them were, mm-hmm. you wanted to hang out with all night. And, uh, you know, so, you know, you need enough to survive, and we need to help as many people that are struggling uh, as much as possible. But it's not going to, you know, once you get past that, survival point the basic needs 
uh, happiness is it, it's it's not based on what you have you yeah. know it's based on how you define yourself and and what you think is important in your life so is there like a directory or something of all these tricks when you create your own trick how do you know that somebody else didn't do it yet um you, yeah a lot of studying and a lot of fact checking uh, we we in uh, legal terms are called a self-governing body so we don't have uh, copyrights the way everyone else does because we never wanted to reveal our magic mm -hmm. to the courts. So we police it ourselves, which is now logistically getting harder and harder because of the amount of magicians that are out there. And uh, you know, eventually some courts are going to have to get involved because we won't be able to police it. But as it stands... We kind of have our brotherhoods, our International Brotherhood of Magicians, Society of American Magicians, the 4F uh, Society of Magic, the Magic Circle in London. Uh, these are all groups I'm a part of. Uh, they kind of are watchdogs, and uh, they they make sure you know you are crediting, and we get into arguments. It, it is a very, uh, it's not a. A, a sexy world, you know, to the magicians going, no, 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 you put your pinky in that place when you're holding the deck of cards, so that's this guy's thing, and uh, and, but you know what, I was uh, I was with David at this this restaurant, and this actor attacked another actor, like this B-level actor, I, I won't say uh, who, who it was, but it was like, in. In Act Three of that movie, you did that thing with the eyebrow. In in '92, I did that eyebrow move in the same type of scene. You stole my eyebrow. Like like these actors were so serious about a, a certain expression that he was accusing another actor of stealing because it was the same type of scene, and you knew that we got a reaction, and you took my eyebrow. <laughs> it's like oh my it's like this this weird face thing. So, you know. It's it's everywhere, you know. If you the devil's in the details, and if you know, you really don't want to know uh, the details of magic. Just like you don't want to know the details of uh, of broadcasting, mm -hmm. and, and it's like, you know, it's 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 uh, it's work. It's 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 you know, it's 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 a job, you know. I feel like I'm a muggle, and I'm sitting with the wizards from Harry Potter's school. Like that's literally what it is. Like it's a whole different culture, subculture group of people just, like it's just just, and you just don't touch the third brick brick to the right you know, <laughs> yeah just, exactly just, so just, whole wall would shift. yeah i mean you basically you just start, you already threw rings your signature is <laughs> two things in one and then you just magically do things with a rubik's cube that just i just don't understand well, this is just the you know what kind of magician can't solve a rubik's cube i you know like i'm not allowed to be normal if i lock my keys in my car you have every right to go mr houdini can't even get in his car <laughs> So if I couldn't solve a Rubik's Cube, you'd say, but but you're a magician, you know, dance magic, monkey dance, which is rude. And I don't think you should say that. That's kind of <laughs> yeah. like, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not a magic monkey, but I'll do this for you on command. So, uh, but this is not magic. This is just showing off. Uh, actually, any seven-year-old with 19 years experience can learn to solve a Rubik's Cube. So uh, I was that seven-year-old, by the way. I um, just don't understand. I <laughs> well... <laughs> and I guess that's the point of yes. why you have a career over there. But, but, it, but that wasn't magic. There's how nothing, is that not magic? Because I did the math and algorithms to solve it. Just because it was one-handed didn't make it magic. Because see, what a magician has to do is we have to take that information and create something that's actually impossible. So solving it one-handed, there's kids on YouTube a lot faster than me. Right. Right? For something to be magic, it needs to be something that can't happen. So we literally are doing the impossible. You know, I can't do what I'm about to do. Uh, zero people can solve the Rubik's Cube in zero seconds, and mm -hmm. I'm one of them. <laughs> you can't even count to zero. It's a mess. Try to count to zero. Right. I'm done. Welcome back. What? <laughs> I, fun fact. The time it takes you to count to zero, you could have counted, like, all the way to one, which is infinitely larger than, than zero. So that's, that's not common core. That's hardcore. That's real math. It's real math. Right? <laughs> so, I just yeah, don't get it. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. So, how did? Oh, Jesus. All right. There's just so much <laughs> you, to cover. Got, There's so much. To cover. You, you got a. You had a phone call with David Blaine. Yes. You vetted the conversation with David Blaine. Yes. David Blaine likes you. He yes. likes your ring. You teach him the ring thing. Mm -hmm. You start working with him, and yeah. then all of a sudden you find yourself back in 
Buffalo after New York, and then you're performing at corporate offices like M&T? Yeah, it seemed like... Do well, you have an I, agent? I, uh, no. I, I, wow. I, I got everything through uh, just the quality of the magic. That's one of my most proud things is I got invited to perform at the Magic Castle in Hollywood without an agent. I got uh, uh, invited to perform for Madonna at her house for a family event without an agent, with just people talking about the quality of the magic. Uh, is, that's, you know, when you, when you have somebody, when you take a shortcut, you know, you're then standing in front of Madonna not knowing if your magic's good enough. Let's, right. For me, that's right. in, in any career. Yeah. You know, the guy in the sweatpants in the corner of the room, he owns the company. He doesn't need to look like he knows what he's doing because he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you know when you when you take these shortcuts, sometimes you know they'll eat away at you, and you'll 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 feel like, do I really deserve this? And you might you might deserve it. You just took a shortcut to mm -hmm. get there, you know. But when you when I just let the magic, so I did it all with a business card and letting the magic speak for itself. So uh, yeah, uh, David Blaine got. It, it, it seems like David Blaine got Evil Knievel's time slot. So Evil Knievel retired. Robbie, his son, took over. Uh, ABC did not want to do a magic show. David was pushing a magic show. And uh, they, they were like, no, go to NBC. Do, you know, go some, we're, we don't have a slot for a, time, for a magic show in, in our schedule all year. So we're not changing our formula to squeeze in a magic show. Mm -hmm. We know what works. We're not going to do this. So I guess, uh, you know, the David's producer and they just kind of looking for an opportunity. Uh, it seems like they got Evil Knievel's time slot because Robbie was done. No one's doing it. So every every five years you do something stupid. Right. And uh, and we he snuck in a magic show with the stunts. So we had to do a stunt. Or else the uh, the show just wouldn't wouldn't happen on ABC. It, it would have been we would have had to go go to a different network. Uh, uh, but it, that's that's kind of the, the the feeling I got from it. And uh, so it wasn't uh, a year round job. You know, at first I was just a, a consultant, and uh, then there was kind of like a, a salary thing for a while. Um, but I would constantly be coming home. You know, because it would be. We're going to take a two-year break and pick up mm -hmm. and plan for the next special, you know. So it, it uh, we were friends that we just, you know, talk once in a while, check up on each other, you know. Um, but, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't live in New York City, so I, you know, I wasn't out there all the time. So I would just go there when when we were uh, when we were sorting out what tricks to do. You know, we start with like 300 tricks and we whittle it down to to 20, and then uh, David chooses what. 10 he wants and then ABC goes but we don't like these three and then we end up with these seven tricks on the on the show uh, we have so much uh, David owns all the footage we have so much B, B which is quality stuff mm -hmm. uh, everything he does is just you know awesome because of his you know who he is uh, it's just fun to, to watch him work and we have some we can make three more specials with just the leftover things we have you know 300 tricks I struggle with like shuffling. Yeah. So how do you? Well, these are tricks that that, that are, on, are on our radar. Let's say. Uh, so they're variations of things that have already kind of yeah things been that are at. things that are created by other inventors uh, or just ideas that we have. We just write them down. That we it's just the process of brainstorming. You know, you you know, it looks like a genius. You know. Uh, you know, when you it, when you look at the final product, you're like, oh man, that was just the best trick to do. And it was like, yeah, it was a lot of work to figure out what's the best trick to do. You know, so it, it, it's it's uh, you have to love what you do and you know keep uh, refining it. But yeah, we we start with a bunch of tricks and we we go, yep, this doesn't fit, but it might be good next year. So we put put that back in, in the the wish list, and then we uh, we focus on the ones that. Uh, fit the message fit the uh you know often we'll we'll look at the stunt and go you know what metaphor is the stunt suggesting and are there tricks that work with that that kind of theme to it are you able to watch other people perform on tv and like 
are you thinking about how they're doing it or are you just enjoying the content like america's got talent they I, always have magicians on yeah i i can turn my brain off and enjoy the moment while another part of my brain is analyzing it but when another magician or anybody says oh i know how they do that what they're really saying is i know how i would do that gotcha because honestly unless you work for the show you don't know how they do that unless you talk to somebody yeah you know when uh, the mask magician was uh, exposing magic on tv uh the guys at the office uh you know all the other inventors working on the show um you know, we went around talking about all the different ways we would have done the same trick. And we were like counting like 42 different ways to saw a woman in half and uh, put her back together. And, uh, you know, it, and it's like, so unless you know exactly what version the magician's doing, you, you still don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what makes magic great is... I didn't know there were 42 different ways to do the same thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just, you know, there's all different uh, assumptions the mind can make. You know, sometimes it can be based on a visual illusion. Sometimes it can be based on a, a tactile illusion. Sometimes it can be based on a, you know, there's multiple visual so, illusions. So what's a tactile illusion? Like, what do you mean? Um, you know, like... A, something that is you, you think you feel something like with sleight of hand uh i can make something appear in your hand and you didn't think there was something there and now it's there uh where your brain didn't detect it because there's parts of your brain that only detect the most the, like the reason pickpockets can get away with it yeah is they hit you in one place so you don't you, you feel the big thing mm -hmm. and you don't feel the the removal of the wallet because oh i'm sorry man sorry uh, you know i'm an idiot uh, and then he's he already got your wallet mm -hmm. and and you're 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 just checking your shoulder because that's where he hit you you know he ran into you and, and now bang your stuff is gone uh wow. that that's uh that's the misuse that's the dark arts that's the misuse of magic and uh it's um you know you know we without getting into the details there's right. there's more than one way to uh to accomplish anything so do you have to or People have to buy in I guess, when they're consuming your magic or something mm -hmm. like that. Like, I remember when I first encountered you, you did that thing where you touch someone's nose and then I feel it. Yes. But you have yeah. to buy in. Me as a consumer, I have to buy into what you're about to do because if I'm discounting everything you're saying, would I be able to feel it still? Because I would have to be in this phase of hypnosis like you were saying. Yeah, with with that illusion, if if you are fighting me, it, it probably won't work. Gotcha. Um, but that's because I'm I'm doing something with hypnosis, basically. Uh, you know, but you know, it, you wouldn't fight something. You know, and I I I've, I don't think I've ever I've only had that happen like maybe once or twice oh, okay. where people fought me on it, and it was because they were forced to be to do it. Like it, the host of the party, like no, you're doing it, and it was like that's you tough. know, and then. It, they're not in a good place. They're not. They don't want to. And uh, you, you, the people I choose. If I'm making the choice, I, I'm I'm choosing the pe the right people that are ready for that, and they're ready to go there. You know, you, you know, no one can hypnotize you and make you do something you don't want to do. That's not possible. Even though that they show that in movies and things like that, uh, hypnosis doesn't work that way. Uh, but it is a a type of magic. You know, it's it's a type of way of experiencing something that isn't happening and that's why i wanted to celebrate it in my show i uh, no go ahead i was yeah. just gonna say did you did you learn that um because you when you were growing up you would make up your own yep yeah tricks I, or whatever, but. after a while i you know once i had collateral once i had a bunch of good tricks that uh people wanted other magicians wanted uh, i was able to trade it for information Okay. So everybody wanted to learn my ring trick. Well, I wanted to learn the principles of that card trick. So instead of buying my video, I'll give you the video if you teach me that. Sure. And that's in the magic industry. It's like a collateral based thing. I, you know, I, you, you could buy my video or I'll just give it to you if you show me how to do that. What, what's that? What's that uh, video game? Fable? Where it's I like a, bar, a barter system? Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Basically. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, so, you know, the magic world was kind of like that. So, it, But instead of just taking the card trick and learning it exactly the way he did it, I, because of my the way I view things, nice. I ripped it apart, discovered the core principle, and invented another trick. Mm -hmm. 
and another trick and another trick. So I'm always, you know, I'm the kid that can't read the instructions on how the radio works, but I'll break the radio apart, put it back together My just way. to learn it. <laughs> and because uh, it's, a, it's a tactile learning. And uh, so I did the same thing with every magic trick that came across my path. Uh, in Tonawanda, there was a magic shop, Four Jokers Magic Shop. I got a job there. And, uh, you know, a full magic shop of magic. And I, I tell the, the owner, I'll learn every trick in this place. Just show it to me and I'll, I'll learn it. And I'll demo it and be able to teach it. And, uh, and that's how I started realizing that not only can I invent, I can teach. So what I would do is you would buy a trick and you would, you would learn it. But I would say, and ah, if you want my notes, I have a whole note. You know, I have this printout that I would sell for an extra like $5. You know? mm-hmm. And then I started realizing people liked my ideas about how to handle certain tricks so that's when I, I built up the courage to um, to consider doing an instructional magic video. So are you able to teach just random people how to do, if you if you wanted to, would, are you able to teach somebody how to do basically all of your tricks, or is there an element of you have to have this type of gift? Because I feel like, so... I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very much against the idea that... Uh, that someone can't do something sure. or, or, you know, in my family with my mother being an artist, uh, when, you know, all my artwork was discredited. Mm-hmm. I actually got one of the reasons I got into magic over art was everybody said, well, yeah, your mother's an artist. So of course you're good. Sure. You know, where it's environment. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't yeah, spend hours drawing circles yeah. and, and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, it does, it, it is, it's, it, in hindsight, I now know it's their way of dismissing why they didn't get good at art. Mm-hmm. 100%. You know, so they, oh, well, yeah, you're just, well, you're, you were, you're, you're genetically uh, dispositioned to run faster, so that's why you're good at, at football. You know, it's, it's not my fault for eating potato chips. You know, it's like, it's your, <laughs> you're just lucky. You know, you're born with the right genes. So, uh, you know, and, and I'm like, I spent hours sketching and drawing all day. You know, that was my backup plan I was going to be an artist and uh, so magic was the one thing and my family was really competitive you know with with any art we did so magic was something that was art but it was something no one else was doing so I could just dive into it uh, all the way Uh, so there are no rules to any art form you know in sports we make rules we take an art and then we make rules to find a way to judge it but if you don't make those rules, there's no way to judge running. Sure. You know, but if you put a straight line and get everybody to follow a set of rules, it's now a game, and then you can make a competition out of it. But running for the sake of running is a beautiful art. Mm-hmm. Um, magic is the same way. I, I know uh, a Madi uh, Gilbert. Uh, he was on uh, Fool Us, uh, a, a friend of mine, a magician with no arms, doing sleight of hand. Like he has, he's, he's, he's got, uh, he's got just, uh, shorter arms. We're at this magic convention once I'm hanging out with him and we're trading secrets because he had to invent everything too. Yeah. You know, so he had to, he, he, he does a riffle shuffle. He, he has two stuff. You you look him up, Marty Gilbert, uh, and, uh, and there's at magic conventions, like any trade show, uh, convention, you know, trade industry convention. Uh, the magicians drink after the, all the lectures and, and talks. And, oh, yeah. and this one magician stumbles up to the bar- bartender and goes, you see that guy? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> He's a magician. She's like, it's a magic convention. You're all magicians. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, no, no, no. But he has no arms. And Madi goes, ah! He screams <laughs> and he looks and it, like as if it was the first time yeah. he noticed it. <laughs> and everyone started dying. Uh, it, it was hilarious. But uh, um, yeah, it, it, you know, I know a quadriplegic that is a, like an illusionist uh, rolling around in a wheelchair. Um, you know, so there's no rules. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I like amazing. I like sleight of hand magic because that's what I, you know, fell in love with. Mm-hmm. But there are there's magic with just numbers and math that are just 
incredible. Uh, there are illusions, you know, that that where the 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 box does everything, and you know, you're still a magician if you're the keeper of an enchanted object. You know, I like sleight of hand because I'm doing magic. Sure. Uh, but Frodo had the magic ring, and he could disappear too. You know, in, in Lord of the Rings, he 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 could vanish. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the keeper of an enchanted object. So if you have uh, a special deck of cards, you know, I personally like the the feeling that I'm causing these things. That it's by my actions these illusions are created, and that gives me the confidence to call myself a magician. Yeah. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with a, a, a special deck of cards that does magic. And you're just the keeper of that deck, and you can have uh, fun entertaining your friends and family with uh, that what we call a trick deck. But it's really an enchanted deck of cards. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it does something that's not supposed to do. Uh, so, you know, those little change of phrases uh, can open your mind to you know what is magic. You know, a rainbow is magic. Mm -hmm. It's there's no floating colors there. Your brain creates it. You know, it's an illusion, and uh, you know, you know, it's a trick. You know, and if I if if I if I tell you rainbows don't exist, you still want to fight me on it, right? It's you know, right there. Yeah. But at the same time, you also know it's refracted light, and it's not actually in the sky there. It's in it's in your brain, and uh, it's magic. It's it's a it's a it's a blessing that we get to see that thing. Like how uh, how blessed are we that we can enjoy s stuff that isn't happening and know that it's. You know, to tell someone they didn't see a ghost 50 years ago, mm -hmm. don't tell me what I didn't see. Right. You don't tell, you know, can't tell me what I saw. Right. But today, that same guy, I could say, well, you saw something, but to define it as a ghost means you understand what exactly it was. I mean, it could be a parallel dimension creature. It could be, I mean, to say that it's a spirit of a human being trapped in a purgatory late state on the, that's a lot of knowing assumptions yeah yeah uh to you know it, it could be electromagnetic field or misfiring of the mind or maybe you're seeing time echo or or you know there's all these other things it could be to say it was a ghost so do you believe in ghosts um i believe the experience of a ghost i would never take away anyone's experience i feel like you would perform to an orb and then the orb would just float away because if i was deceased and i encountered you i would hover <laughs> around you and then in front of like you were doing something for an audience and then i would literally just float my orb self away in disgust of like what in the world no they, they they the orbs hang around you know they 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 you know you, they got nothing but time on their hands i mean they just uh, how do you know maybe like, they're just interested in the show yeah well you know i mean the last orbs that I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this is all pre COVID, of course, you know, things, you know, if you're listening in the future before COVID, there were orbs that would follow people around. And, uh, this is, uh, there's just things changed, man. You know, that, that was, uh, that, that was, those BC. were the days, you that know, BC. yeah, those, those are all before COVID. <laughs> I, love it. I, I feel like if I had this type of gift, I would be shuffling a deck like all the time. Yeah. So were there, were there moments where you just caught yourself just oh, doing yeah. things with Creating your hands? It. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I, it's I, just I, kind of, I, I, had I a, feel like I would be in the same boat too. What I've noticed too is I'd watch, you watch dealers in Vegas or somebody that does play with cards all the time, or even just a magician and you're watching them work and they're, it's a, they're just fluid to a different level than someone who plays poker four times a week with the boys. Like that's, Okay, you're you're decent with a deck of cards, but you're not fluid with your fingers like a pianist is. You know what I mean? It's a different league. So, is that a time thing, or was that kind of like a gift? Yeah, where I mean, it, it, it's something that just evolves. You don't actually have to aim for that. It's not a like a skill set you you aim for. It's just because you have a deck of cards in your hands so much. Yeah. I I was working with a, a. How did you get it back underneath when it was just on top? So you just. You pull it. Yeah, pulled it back down with the thumb. Yeah, normal things. Yeah. All right. So just, just for <laughs> that's like the I'm, most I'm elementary really, thing yeah. he's going to do. Yeah. 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 Well, how did you take the cards out of the box? That was crazy. <laughs> did, you, did you physically touch the box though? <laughs> Only the orb knows. <laughs> so, I uh, I was playing uh, with a, a, a chess master, you know, and uh, they were telling me that they could tell who's a good chess player based on their first move. 
Okay. Not because of what move they do. Right. But how they move the piece. Okay. So like the the bottom of the chess piece has got a, a, a an angle at the base and a curve. And the reason for that is uh, there's a design element to it. When you come down in front of the piece with your piece to take, the you can actually push straight down on that angle and the piece that's on the board will slide into your hand so you could place the piece dead center in the square. So like instead of like capturing and then readjusting the piece, it just looks like it becomes the piece. And these speed chess players are it's just poetry watching them play. They will it looks like they put the piece down exactly where the other piece was because they did because they know to hit just at the right angle at the base of the piece and it scoot it, it shoots the piece into their hand that they're capturing see i want to i want these nicks and tricks with whiskey and stogies right but well yeah but watching a you know flair uh bartending uh, evolved because bartenders just got into a rhythm with mm-hmm. how they mix drinks True. and then they added cute little tricks after the fact but if Flair was really, they were actually just making drinks. They and they were, the the cool stirring techniques they would do are actually part of making a quality drink. You know, if you if you study, you know, with like guys that at Masuda Chow's or or where what the friends Jason at you know Vera's and mm-hmm. and stuff like that, they were showing me all these uh, uh, these m- making. There's there's a functionality. It, it looks cool. But they're actually there's a reason they did it that sure. way. Yeah. So in the, in the same thing evolves. I mean now there is an art uh, that's called cardistry where where you are just cutting the deck for show and you're making it look good. Uh, where it's it's for a um, it's for the aesthetics of the uh, it's juggling it's micro right. juggling. And there, there's magic and art to that as well. It's like Fuji Grill. Yeah. You don't have to flip the egg. Yeah, you know, and then cut it with a spatula. Yeah, well, it's it's like, uh, yeah, that's the next step. Yeah. You know, so at first, you know, the way a, a magician sp- spreads a deck of cards, most people can't do that. You know, most no, I most just people got nauseous most people that. couldn't <laughs> couldn't couldn't spread the deck of cards like that, uh, and that's not a flourish. You know, but that does evolve because I've asked people to pick cards so much that it just becomes how I handle a, a deck of cards. So it's uh, it becomes a fidget more than anything. Are you able to just like not fidget? No, no, <laughs> no. So, what, my, so when you drive, like my, if you're driving around in the near a red light, are you just doing something else over here? No, like, no. Do you drive I, a ten, and, ten and two, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, and I never text on the phone <laughs> while driving. Uh, no, it's uh, yeah. No, it actually is very hard. Uh, you know, I, to me, you know, when I'm driving, I'm thinking about operating the vehicle because I, I love the idea of manipulating things mm-hmm. and True. you know it is kind of this extension of your body and uh, you know I, I'm actually most of the time thinking how amazing that I felt the rock on the front re, you know mm-hmm. driver yeah, yeah the tire. front left right the there, front yeah. left right feeling the rock he destroyed his uh, tire and yeah. blew his tire driving right. to one of our Thanks, old interviews yeah. in his car we Actually, felt the rock yeah but but you knew exactly where you hit it <laughs> yeah and, oh yeah and that's exactly where and that's that's because your brain is so awesome at adapting that it can feel the vibrations in the steering wheel and in the seat and the car becomes an extension of your body. That's why we can parallel park mm-hmm. our vehicle, but we struggle with somebody else's, True. right? And it's because you got you, your brain got used to that. It's like that's your body, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, uh, it's you know we change shapes to to fit in different worlds, but you know, you know, yeah, I be I, the water. I, I, I yeah, I argued with this parent who was like, you know, close this. Uh, kids uh, Minecraft account or something like that it wasn't Minecraft it was some game where he earned all these credits to buy this car and by closing the account he this his car that he that he earned that was deleted and the parents were like yeah, he, 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 it's not even a real car and it's all this and I'm like what's the difference between you going to a job working 40 hours to get to get money of you know your time becomes value and then purchase a real car that sits in your driveway that only takes you to a job you hate. Or somebody working 40 hours a week to earn enough credits to buy a virtual car in a game that they love. You know, that car is time is value is 
You can't use logic. Yeah. No, no, no. But I'm no, sure but it's it, it's you. a world it's a world that we are entering in mm-hmm. where yeah. you know, this world will always exist. You know, my one of my favorite movies like I Am Legend. Mm-hmm. I you know, they had futuristic things, but they also had a rotary phone. You know, it's like those aren't going to go, you know, the past doesn't get deleted because we, we live in the future. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, every new technology is there, but every old technology still will be there. So we'll have the option of working in a virtual world, an augmented world, a, uh, uh, you know, I got to perform for the Microsoft event uh, and I got to see you know, all this technology that they think is going to be standard in a house in 20 years. And uh, it's just amazing. But there, it's not going to look like that. It's going to look like that with everything else. You know, all the, the past doesn't get erased. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with changing our shape. There's nothing wrong with... But when you think that you own the car and the car is not a part of you, you know... We are we're already cyborgs from a magician's point of view, because half of the information that I used to keep in my head is now in my phone and only my phone. Who cares if it's not in my body? Mm-hmm. It's an extension of my brain. Yeah, you know, and uh, it doesn't forget, so it does a better job than me. <laughs> you know, at remembering you know my grandmother's phone number. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but now it's a crutch. Mm-hmm. You know, so you want to take these tools but realize they're supposed to be tools you know you should know how to do the math before you use a calculator you know magic is one of the art forms that doesn't follow that the first thing we do is give kids a trick deck of cards and that's like giving somebody a calculator before they know how to do math well, what's the difference between a trick deck of cards and just a deck of cards um there there are certain ways of uh cutting cards or printing cards that uh, will give a magician an advantage uh, to uh, create illusions that are that are impossible. There's, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so there's a thing called the Svengali deck that is a lot of fun that you could buy and, and uh, you know, do some amazing things with. Uh, but, of course, you're the keeper of the enchanted object. Mm-hmm. It's different than, you know, being a magician. It's like um, a butterfly knife compared to just a normal knife. Yeah, uh, yeah it, can, anyway. it can swivel, but at the end of the day, both knives can still cut some cheese. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. I'm learning so much, man. I know. I'm proud of you. So, so I'm still uh, you're still you're, well, well. Well, most card tricks they're they're always Don't. the same. They say pick a card, and the magician's going to find it. So pick a card. Oh my god. I want to be different. I want to be special. <laughs> That's the same thing, right? So all I got to do is keep track of the card, right? Yeah. So I, I know that's your card, and these are not. Right. That's a lot of information. I mean, and, you know, oh, keeping track, Do you keeping track of one card. So, they, so the viewers know what you're doing. Keeping track of one card in one deck is like keeping track of one sticker on a Rubik's Cube. Yeah. Right? So all I got to do is keep track of the card. Hold on. Let me show them. Yeah, I was going to do it. Then you could place it back. Then all I got to do is follow exactly where this card goes. Now, it looks like it's lost, right? But I would be lying if I told you I didn't know. You know, the biggest fans of magic are other magicians. And they know how it's done, and they still love it. Penn and Teller do the Foolish <laughs> Show because they love magic. You know, they're, they're, they're some of magic's biggest fans. So right now, your card is 42 from the top. I don't know what it is. I haven't looked at it. I don't need to look at it because right now, it's 27 from the top. Do you just know that because you know how you shuffle? I know how. If you shuffle, I'd have no idea where that card is. <laughs> uh, but I, I know your card is not number one. It's not 52. But straight to the middle is 26. Uh, your card, the, uh, was it the three of clubs, I think? Yep, your card. 27 down, the three of clubs. Yes. What was your card? Not that. But you get the idea. So what was, uh, what was it? Jack of spades. Yeah. Look at the three of clubs. Here we go. Come on. <laughs> Did you throw it and catch it? Like? All right, yeah, that's fine. All right. that, 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 that's, that's the part. That, 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 that's, that's the, the part. Is you shocked with how he threw it? No, I missed that. I was I was too busy throwing up over here because of the other aspects. <laughs> well, I can't. Well, that's so, the cool thing about being a magician. I don't even have to be right. Like, jugglers actually have to juggle. Mm-hmm. Right. I just have to make you believe I was right. Because that is the three of clubs all the time. And you saw what you wanted to see. 
Yeah, then he flips it back. See, I can't, you know what? So, and, and this is something that you brought up earlier you with you spoon. being a, taking it to that next level to send to then say that this is something that's impossible to do. You can do that trick if you knew exactly how you shuffle and coincidentally you know that it's a 27 27th card yeah and 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 once you've been doing magic after a while people just kind of expect that of you Mm -hmm. you know i I, when i was 16 i did this trick where i would shuffle the deck you shuffle the deck you name any card i could pop it out while blindfolded and then i keep on shuffling and i put the whole deck of cards in order and man i used to close my show with it it was like awesome then I became 18 and 19, and I, you know, it got to a place where people went, oh, yeah, well, yeah, you're a magician. You're, yeah, obviously, you can do that. You know, I didn't get the same reaction. Mm-hmm. It Who was, the hell said that? Well, it was just the emotion of the audience. You know, like, when I was 16 and was doing that, it was like this kid can put the whole deck of cards in, in order while shuffling. But after a while, you know, I was showcasing so many other skills that they just kind of expected that of me. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, he can do anything. So well, by the end a of terrible the, audience member. That's well, a ton of work to do actually, these simple things. Actually, I, I always blame the artist. So I, I structured the show wrong because I was demonstrating skill throughout the whole show. So, be you know, I didn't create texture. So by the end of the show, people just expected me, uh, that I can do that. So, you know... When when something like that is happening, and it is kind of it's 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 a weird thing for them to go, oh yeah, well yeah, you can do that. So yeah, that it, that sounds like a horrible audience, and a magi- normal magicians would blame the audience. But I look at it going, well, what put them in the frame of mind to think that way? Was it because I solved the Rubik's cube before, and maybe I was popping the cards around, and, and you know maybe everything in that show was skill based, and I, I'm pretty sure back then it was. Uh, where now I try to. I try to amaze people with just thoughts and ideas. You know, the idea of saying that my name was given to me before I was born, and it's just the noises you would make to get my attention. Like, that's already a magical thing. You know, like, you probably never thought about Mm -hmm. your name is just noises people make to get your attention. You know, what noises do I make to get your attention? You know, that type of thing, where it's like... Yeah, that's all a name really is. It's just I look up when I hear that type of those n- sounds in that order make me look up. Right. I'm just a well trained monkey, so I <laughs> uh, it, it's you know so it's a that's it's just a, a different paradigm. I, I, you know, I always am looking from from a magician point of view. I'm supposed to be the weird guy in the woods, historically speaking, the Merlin, the guy that has a different take. Mm-hmm. And so if everybody uh, thinks it should be one way, I'm always going to be the contrarian. I'm always going to be, but what about this? And what about, you know, and it looks like I'm the fool, I'm the dunce, I'm the, the jester, I'm the You're prankster. Uh, it looks like I'm dumb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, no, dunce was somebody who was, uh, he was like a, a, a pastor philosopher, or not a pastor, but like a, a, a clergy philosopher. And uh, the conical hat, was actually to filter knowledge into his head. Uh, that's why the wizard hats and witches hats were all about gaining knowledge. Uh, but he was like one of the first to argue, well, can you prove this table exists? Like, you know, just because you touch it and feel it and, and sense it, like, does that mean it totally exists or can that be an illusion? And it's kind of like, yeah, okay, you're right. <laughs> I can't prove the table exists, but what do you do with that? You know, it's like, uh, it's these uh, things that are that are honest and true, but not useful. You know, it's it's information that's not useful. So, uh, it, it, the dunce cap actually was somebody who was too smart for his own good because it it just, you know, and and I think it evolved because you know, some kid said something in a class and oh you you think you're so smart you must wear this hat, and and that's kind of that the the dunce hat because that was the uh, the clergy's that 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 guy he that was his his uh his type of hat man i wish i knew about that in school yeah, yeah. just because i'm just smarter than you <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um but uh, you know i always like to to twist things and ask you know what is a different way to look at this and that provides you know i'll do it with a deck of cards but if i if i can amaze you with a painting or my signature i'll do it you know but well, just you know what that worked yeah so. i had you in a low 
<laughs> yeah. Yes, you did. So we talked a lot about you working with uh, David Blaine and you creating tricks and then basically working with him for him to perform the tricks. But you've also been performing tricks on your own in front of audiences. And now recently you had a TV um you're on TV, right? Yep. So do you want to talk about that, too? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I just had an opportunity to perform uh, for Penn & Teller Fool Us, uh, the, the TV show. It's going to air uh, in, a, in a couple of days, so I, I really can't talk much about sure. what it actually went down uh, in the experience. But, uh, yeah, my, my magic has already been on America's Got Talent and David Blaine. You know, so it really wasn't uh, to prove that my magic was good because mm -hmm. I've already seen my magic at that level. Uh, I, you, you know, it's our, other guys have done my tricks on Penn and Teller Fool Us and, and they won. Uh, so, you know, I wanted to, you know, it was just the right thing to do at the time mm -hmm. and it, it, it was a way of, you know, testing my own nerves. Like, I don't like the limelight. I don't think, you know, if everybody knows you're the magician you can't surprise them you know I, I have a, a friend who's uh, a national TV star in Japan and he was saying to me once that you know I can't go out and just mess around mm -hmm. you know he was also like an inventor he would love creating magic but he can't anymore because everybody knows him he can't go outside without being recognized and uh, and I'm like, come to Buffalo. Nobody will know, and we'll hang out, and we'll, literally, we'll, we, you know, we'll we'll mess with people, and everyone will just lose their mind. Uh, they won't know you're that person, mm -hmm. and because uh, we don't care, you know, <laughs> you know, we, you know, Keanu Reeves was living here for a while, and it was like, yeah, hey, Matrix guy, you want a drink? You know, that's, <laughs> you know, we didn't. It, it was like, you know, he sent his bodyguards home, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, we we have this like spirit. I think we're just conserving energy because we know it could get cold at any time. You know? <laughs> so we're just you like, <laughs> you know, we're just we're just staying warm. We're just eating food. We're gonna we're every every, t every day we're hibernating. <laughs> That's all we're doing. So, uh, but yeah. So I I never was seeking out for celebrity because I knew as soon as you get to certain levels, your magic has to be like unbelievable. Or you know, if it's just a, a, a little moment. Then people go, oh, that's what they, you know, that's what that guy did. That's what this guy did. Oh, that's, you know, that's cool, I guess. You know, so I like, I like surprising people. I like them going, who's this idiot? And right. then within minutes, I'm their best friend. And within uh, 20 minutes, I get them to let go of some psychological baggage that was in their life. And, 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 you know, I, I help them with their next actionable step in their life. You know, the, what's the next thing they need to do? And I don't have to, you know, like a, a, a therapist would actually have to know what, you, what, you're, what you're struggling with. Magic just kind of puts you in the frame of mind that, that you're like, it's either anything's possible or I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And those two things, the, the words I don't know has so much healing in it. Because if you can admit you don't know, you can find out the answers. If you know two plus two is five, you will struggle for the, your whole life not knowing why. Things won't line up and th you'll be late to everything. You know, the, you know you, you're going to mess up so much because you know two plus two is five. The permission to recalibrate, to go, well, how do I know what two plus two is? And to question yourself, even though you know it, you know, to go back to the drawing board and just double check magic when you witness a moment of astonishment i wipe away object permanence i wipe away your early childhood development skills and you have to reevaluate everything you know mom played peekaboo in every culture there's a peekaboo game mm -hmm. around the world and basically mom's learned stop crying every time you don't see me you, you dumb dumb baby when, you know you know when you don't see me i don't cease to exist i'm going to come back you know every time you don't see me stop crying and they make a game out of it and the kids laugh and they learn object permanence. They learn that just because it's out of sight doesn't mean it ceases to exist. Because, you know, when you're, when you're a baby, you might not have learned that yet. That, so the reasons baby might, babies might cry is mom no longer exists when she goes to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that game teaches object permanence. 
well, here's a magician with a ring, and you know that that ring is there, but then it's not. And now I just mess with object permanence, and everything, everything you learned and all your fundamentals are now brought to question. So all of your choices in your life go back to your early childhood. And even though you're going to re reassume the same things about objects and, and color and, and time and space, you have the permission to change things, reevaluating. And that's what magic really gives people. Why, why magic has never gone away, why magic benefits society is it's an experience that is a spiritual one in many ways, but it's not, you know, supernatural. It is all about concepts. It's about your identity and how you define yourself. And it, these magic moments give you permission to reevaluate. Which, does that help you get through that show? Because you know that that's what you're giving to people? Well, that's, that's my goal. You know, that's why I do magic. Yeah. Uh, the, the show was a, was a way to, to just reach more people. Um, there was this trick I designed, and I, I just don't like hype. I don't like, uh, you know, when people say this is the best ever and you got to, you know, number one trick of the year, you know, all this stuff. I just like let the trick speak for itself. But a, a close friend of mine, another magician inventor, uh, he said to me, is the trick good? And I went, yeah, no, yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. And he said, well, then it's your job to get it to as many magicians as possible. And if hyping it up helps you achieve that goal, it's your responsibility to do it. Mm -hmm. Cause there are people that are hyping bad tricks and getting them out there. But if yours is good, you owe it to the world to sell it, sell, sell the hell out of it. And, and so I feel like I couldn't have any conversations ever with a magician, even though I, I'm doing it today. I just feel like the, the profoundness of every word you guys speak, it's just like a different caliber of conversation. It's because we come at it. We come at life from a different angle. No doubt. You know, we you know, and, and actually we're, you, you are a magician. You are an artist. Shut up, Derek. <laughs> In what sense? Okay, so... Because I don't bend with the spoon at the moment. Well, there's performance magicians, and then there's magic. So every, every, everything goes back to magic. You know, the medical staff with the snakes that wrap around the, the wand mm -hmm. with the wings, that's a magic symbol. That's, that's magic. You know, uh, pharmakia is the old term for witchcraft. It's, if this ties into the Freemasons, I'm literally going to leave. <laughs> if you want. <laughs> well, you know, it actually tie, it will tie into everything. So pharmakia is the old term for witchcraft, which is pharmacy today. So any chemical alteration of your state of mind. Here at Pearl Street, we're hearing the brew, uh, the witch's brew, because that's experts that now know how to mess with chemistry in order to ch alter, you know, to change your state of mind. My that's a form of magic. So... There was this group of people called humanity. And then this person said, I don't feel like people. I feel like person. I'm going to go out in the woods. And people went, whatever he's doing is weird. He's creepy. Thus was born the magician. Because he just didn't feel like people. Mm -hmm. He had dyslexic. He was dyslexic or something. He just, he, he went, I, I don't people well, you know. So he was this weird guy in the woods. Then people had a problem. And a weird guy in the woods can see from a different point of view. Well, no, you guys are just, you know, you're just doing this. And people went, damn it, weird guy's right. Now he's king. So now we've magically created name. You know, we, we were humanity. You know, we long for concerts and sporting events and theater events because we need that reminder that we're not different, that these identities we get to play are beautiful and they're art pieces, but the truth is we're, we are a living organism on a living organism that's Earth called humanity. Somebody in China gets sick, it affects us all. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not that separate. But we love the art piece that's called society, that's called identity. And so that becomes, if everybody goes, ooh, look what he's doing. Well, now you've made an artist. If everyone goes, ooh, I want to do that too. You've now 
created fandom and then ident- if, if everyone is do if everybody takes a name, well now it's just identity and now it's just reality. So you were this blank canvas called an animal and you decided, you know, I decided to be Garrett, the magician. And everybody else agrees with me, so it's stuck. That's that's the only that's that and so everybody is an artist and everybody is a magician. And it takes performance magic to remind you of that. You know, Picasso said that art is the lie that makes us realize the truth. Well, magic is the exaggeration of a moment for you to understand what is true. And this whole world is a blessing that we get to play in, but it is not, it it is a simulation. You know, when scientists talk about that we live in a simulation, they're not talking about a computer one, most of them, you know. There are fringe theories that think it actually could be a computer simulation, but the Matrix. most of most of the Matrix is an artistic representation of the very fact that you're you are simulating everything in this moment chemically in your brain. None of it's happening out here. It is a simulation. It's a chemical simulation, right? So your all your senses are being, in you know, you think you're feeling this at the tip of your finger. But it's just a chemical reaction in your brain creating the illusion that you're feeling it at the tip of your finger. I think about this honestly way too much. You can't. Here's the thing with Derek. You can't. <laughs> you can't do this stuff because now he's just. Get, yeah. Is it gonna actually stop? See, no. I think that that to you. That's how you know if you're dreaming. That's what right. I was just gonna say. The movie Inception. That is your. That is your thing. Could be. Tell me when that gets annoying. It <laughs> won't get annoying. <laughs> We've been listening to a hum for three hours. I know. <laughs> so, all right. I think we've been talking for like an hour and a half or something like that. But I, this is amazing. Yeah, I could honestly talk to you all night. Thank you. But so when we came in here, you were doing some other stuff too. Do you educate people in the Buffalo area about magic? And then yeah. also where can people find you normal? Like, do you have regular gigs? He just um, appears, Derek. Yeah, you'll just <laughs> encounter me when you need me. You know, just say Candyman in a mirror three times and, and look under your pillow. And, you, and, the, the, and the orb will tell you where to find me. You know, I'll try and follow the orbs. Follow the orbs. <laughs> yes. um, in, in Western New York, right now everything's up in the air, but uh, I am back at Masuda Chow's on Tuesdays. Hopefully we'll be there uh, soon on the weekends, all depending on protocol for this time. Uh, but, you know, no matter what, the best you know best way is just look up my name and magician and uh you'll find me on facebook instagram and all that i'm gonna be posting more about my appearances on pen and teller fool us and probably uh, have uh, videos on my youtube channel uh so uh just you know things that uh, i want to share with the world you know it's not like a very regular thing i do but uh every once in a while i'll put up a video uh talking about these crazy ideas do you do private events at all oh yeah yeah, yeah. any anywhere uh, that i can help and be a part of the 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 event uh i do now virtual magic uh, where if you you know i have a lot of events that are canceling but they you know they promise their son that they would have a magician and you know so the parents still want to do something so we create this like party atmosphere on zoom and then i you know come in and do a little demonstration uh through virtual magic i created a a whole new because i'm an inventor uh, i didn't just take the magic i do and put it on zoom i actually created a a a zoom show that can only be done in zoom you know so i'm actually uh, messing with that theater oh cool um but uh yeah anywhere that uh that people want magic at different levels. I have a, a touring company that, you know, when before COVID, we would have a, a, a portable 300 seat theater with, uh, you know, multimedia projection stuff. And we would plug and play in different black box theaters with uh, two other magicians, a street magician named Cosmo and, and uh, uh, Joe Goretti, uh, you know, performing as Joe Maxwell. Uh, we, um, we, we just go to these small uh, towns that would never get to see magic and uh, just everybody comes out to, uh, to uh, experience the, the show because you know we go out of our way to, to, to find these places that most shows mm-hmm. would skip. And uh, they, you know, just a way to give back, just constantly looking at things like that. So in Western New York, if you need any information about magic, just find me and uh, I'll point you in the right direction. And uh, if you want to learn sleight of hand magic, uh, you know, if you want to get into some difficult stuff, uh, you know, or just uh, 
uh, get a, an artistic point of view on any art form. You know, I do consultations for uh, puppeteering and dancers and uh, painters, and you know, I help out. You know, from a magician's point of view, we're going to have thoughts that most people wouldn't consider, mm-hmm. and we're going to have uh, filters that will help you judge your art form in a new way. So I've always been able to um, ask good questions, you know, so that's, uh, that's gets to the good answers. Mm-hmm. So any way I can help out, let me know. Cool. Well, Garrett, thank you so much that for joining amazing. us today. This was such a good conversation. Thank you. Uh, everybody go follow Garrett on his social media and then also tune in. Uh, we'll post bef- because this will come out after you are on Penn and Teller, but we'll post about it coming up that you will be on. Let's get a ton of attention to you because you're you're amazing, man. Thank you. It's incredible. So thank, thank you, you so very much, much for your time. time. Oh, my pleasure.